Hello, ladies and gentle soars. Welcome to, or back to, Orbis Pagona, my seed world project that takes place on Orbis Pagona, a world seeded with many fish, plants, and invertebrates, but is mostly inhabited by descendants of Pagona Viticeps, or the Central Bearded Dragon. So far in each episode, I've taken some time in the beginning to explain the backstory, and I will no longer be doing this going forward. So, if this is the first time you're seeing this, go to my channel and click the Orbis Pagona playlist to get up to speed. In the last episode, we dove into the evolution of some of the planet's insects. However, some of these invertebrates, as well as the large herbivorous animals, are getting to be too much to handle for our basal carnivores like Pagona Viticeps and Pagona Galabus. Today, we'll go back to those dragons and see how they've adapted to balance the ecosystem. So far, the nature of these videos sort of makes it seem like the last two episodes took place one after another, but really they took place at roughly the same time, and so will this video, still in the early Phytonian period. In the Vitacene, bearded dragons like Pagona Galabus relied on swallowing other bearded dragons whole as a means of dispatching their prey. But with the emergence of large herbivores like Neuchosaurus and the cow beetle, this strategy is becoming much less viable. Some Pagona Viticeps begin to use their sharp teeth and powerful jaws to take on larger prey items. They begin to target the legs, midsection, and tails of Neuchosaurus. This new strategy allows them to rip off chunks of flesh and sometimes whole limbs off their prey, instead of being forced to swallow the animal whole. Enter the Mordo Laceris Savis, whose name means the flesh-tearing savage, but we'll call them the savage dragons for short. Coming in at a length of just over 4 feet, or over 120 centimeters, and weighing about 25 pounds or 12 kilograms, these guys are much larger than any of our other land-based carnivores, for now. A few things set these dragons apart from their ancestors. The main one being the adaptation of sliding jaws, something that can be seen in Gorgonopsids, as well as Rhynchocephalians like the Tuatara. With these sliding jaws, they can move their jaws in a sawing-like motion allowing them to break down large bits of animal matter a lot more efficiently. This adaptation is further enhanced by a stout neck that supports strong muscles, which the savage dragon uses to rip away flesh from their victim. Typically, said victim is an adult Neuchosaurus. A mortal Laceris will run up to the side of a Neuchosaurus and use its sliding jaws and serrated teeth to quickly slice off a mouthful of flesh and retreat. To perform this attack and reduce the risk of being clawed at or bit by the larger reptile, the mortal Laceris have become faster, running up to speeds of 13 miles per hour or 20 kilometers per hour. They can run at these speeds because they have adopted a more semi-erect posture, something that is seen in monitor lizards or crocodilians when they're running. This is compared to the slow, lumbering Neuchosaurus, who can hardly reach 8 miles per hour or 12 kilometers per hour in a full sprint. Of course, the Neuchosaurus live in herds, but don't quite have the intelligence to protect one another. Most often, the buffet will simply retreat at the sight of another Neuchosaurus being attacked. The corpse will, of course, attract the attention of animals like Dragonhawks, but also other mortal Laceris. Much like their ancestors, these guys are very aggressive towards one another, but with exceptions. If the two or more savage dragons are all a similar size, they may tolerate each other while they dine on a corpse. If one savage dragon is clearly larger than the others, it will most likely bully the others away. One last adaptation that sets the savage dragon apart is a single tooth that is in front of and different from their other teeth. This tooth is more robust and unserrated, almost resembling a spike on the backside of a warhammer. It is used to puncture through the carapace of young cow beetles, which some of you pointed out is not how beetles work, as beetles do not grow larger after they pupate, so I'm going to make an addition to the cow beetles specivo here. Cow beetles have the ability to molt like arthropods. I'm not, I'm not backpedaling. They evolved to molt because I said so. Thank you. Mortalaceris will often prey upon freshly pupated cow beetles as they are an excellent source of calcium that is essential to the diet of all bearded dragons. They cannot, however, use this tooth to crack through the adult's carapace, leaving fully grown cow beetles still without a natural predator. This shell cracking tooth is actually a remnant of their egg tooth, which they never shed. This one tooth actually has some pretty heavy implications for the future of predators on Orbis Pagona, but for now, the mortal Laceris is the top land predator on the planet. Or is it? Some Pagona Galabas, instead of adjusting their lifestyle, simply double down. They continue to try and eat increasingly larger and older bearded dragons, growing larger themselves with generations. Meet the Orskizis Veraci, whose name means the voracious split mouth, but we'll call them the split mouth dragons. 
The Orschizus foraci is a descendant of Pagona galabis that has adapted a split lower mandible that allows them to swallow much larger prey items whole, much like snakes. Coming in at a length of 7 feet or just over 2 meters and weighing 55 pounds or 25 kilograms, the split mouth dragon is even larger than the savage dragon, though it does not prey on larger lizards like the savage dragon does. Instead, the split mouth dragon preys upon primarily adult Pagona viticeps, Pagona galabis, young cow beetles, and really just about anything it can fit down its gullet, their favorite snack being Nuchosaurus eggs. Like their cousin the Savage Dragon, they too can run up to speeds of about 13 miles per hour, or 20 kilometers per hour, which allows them to easily catch any fleeing bearded dragons, though you might notice that they have very stubby legs. They move around close to the ground, gliding over terrain on their stomach and tail, sort of like a skink. They move this way to help them save energy for when they need to chase prey items, in which case they will adopt a more erect posture, more typical of their relatives. A little known fact is that bearded dragons actually have venom, not nearly enough to affect something as large as you or me, but enough to immobilize small prey items so they don't move around in their stomach. The split mouth dragons have developed a more potent venom for this same reason. The added benefit of this is that if a prey item somehow manages to escape the jaws of a split mouth dragon, it will become paralyzed not much longer after escaping, allowing the split mouth to try again. However, escaping that is not a common occurrence, as much like snakes, their teeth face backwards, making it pretty unlikely for anything to escape once it's in the gaping maw of the split mouth. The Orskizor will sometimes even prey upon Mordolaceris, either as an act of desperation or not knowing any better. Trying to eat an adult Mordolaceris is dangerous, as not only does the split mouth risk being on the receiving end of their sharp teeth, but also because their venom often isn't potent enough to paralyze them. So, these two dragons solve the Nuchosaurus and Cow Beetle problem to some degree, but what about the whole dragonfly problem? Cut back to episode 1, where we introduce Pagona Sandaris, a bearded dragon with a prehensile tail and larger claws suited for an arboreal lifestyle. Though the majority of their diet is plant matter, the emergence of large flying insects creates opportunity for this arboreal dragon. First, the climbing dragons begin to sneak up on dragonhawks, perched on any branches, with limited success. For those of you who don't know, bearded dragons, as well as many other lizards, have sticky tongues they use to pick up bugs much like chameleons, but of course not nearly to the same degree as chameleons just a few centimeters in front of their face. We are going to demonstrate the tongue of the bearded dragon. Um, I got some freeze-dried crickets for him here. You watch him, his tongue is going to come out. He's going to grab it with his tongue. Do that again. I think you'll get a slow-mo of that. We'll zoom in right into his face. Grabs it with his tongue, brings it in his mouth. The climbing dragons that have the longest tongues have the most success in catching these dragonflies, as well as the dragons who have the best colors and patterns for blending into the environment around them. Becoming the strongest and most well-fed of the climbing dragons, these camouflage sharpshooting beardies are selected as the best mates, and their traits are passed down over generations. This gives us the Pagona Lingutox, whose name means the arrow-tongued beard, but we'll call them the Marksman Dragon for short. They haven't gotten too much bigger, weighing just a little over 2 pounds and not exceeding 33 inches or 86 centimeters. The most obvious change is their coloration. The Marksman Dragon's scale pattern resembles that of tree bark, allowing them to of course seamlessly blend into the branches or trees that they sit on. They may even take the appearance of a branch by hanging off the branch they're on with their prehensile tail, much like their cousin the Pagona Sandaris. The sticky tongue of these dragons has evolved to be incredibly long, almost twice the length of the dragon it's shooting out of. A marksman dragon can use their tongue to snatch a prey item up to 5 feet or 1.5 meters away. Their prey of choice are, of course, the dragon hawk. Though they are larger than the Pagona Lingotox, the marksman dragon will target their head or wings to keep them from fleeing, so they can slowly chew them apart. Most of the marksman dragon's diet is insects, but plant matter still makes up as much as 20% of their diet, with their favorite fruity snack being wild grapes. You'll notice that this dragon is within the same genus as our other dragons from episode 1. This is because despite having some unique adaptations, they are still genetically very similar to the Pagona Sandaris and other members of his genus. In fact, hybridization between the marksman and the climbing dragons is not totally uncommon, though most of the time these hybrids are infertile. As the Phytonian explosion continues to coat the planet in plants, we see the rainforests and jungles become much more densely packed, which allows both Pagona Sandaris and Pagona Lingotox to more safely leap between trees without fear of falling. Perhaps in the future, we may see some new adaptations emerge as a result of this new behavior. 
all three of these carnivorous dragons have heavy implications on the future of Orpus Pagono's ecosystems and biodiversity, and are the first aggressors in an evolutionary arms race that will be fought for eons. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like, a comment, and of course hit the subscribe button. If you'd like to talk with other people that enjoy the channel, consider joining the Discord. And if you'd like to be more involved in the channel and its content, consider joining the Patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member to use these funny emojis during premieres or live streams. Shout out to all of our patrons, some of which include Julia Porter, Lex Gunn, Galactic Narwhal, Rhubarb 600, Green Turret, Tyler Sparks, The Juan Kaiser, and Mr. Matt. Once again, thanks for stopping by and I'll see you next time.